so like, like Pastor Patty said, go ahead and take out your message notes, grab yourself a pen and the seat back. We're going to get going in a second, but first, we're going to pray. How's that? Say yeah. yeah. All right. Well, God, we are grateful, and we are humbled that you have gathered us here today to hear your word. Uh, we ask that you touch us and inspire us. Uh, so that we can be better prepared to be your church wherever we go. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And people said, amen. 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 Now, I just want to let you know, um, maybe you're going to start, stop listening to me in a second, because um, I did not start out life as a pastor, not in the least. Uh, fact is, I didn't become a pastor until I was almost 50 years old. Uh, and more fact, I wasn't even raised as a Christian. I was not Christian like your Pastor Patty. I grew up on Long Island, uh, New York, and I was a Catholic, sort of. Just sort of. I was a Catholic because my family said I was. That's, that's all I know. Uh, but then when I was about 35, um, after a series of experiences that um, were unbeknownst to me preparing me for something, um, I began to believe in Jesus. So what I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that... Um, I wasn't very familiar with God, uh, the church, the Bible, anything religious, anything spiritual, for all of my childhood and a good part of my uh, earlier adulthood, too. I, I just didn't know anything. So when the people who were trying to uh, teach this uh, grown-up woman about Jesus uh, told me that I should read the Bible to find out about him... Um, I listened to them. I listened to them. I, I, I'd read plenty of books. I was an adult. How hard could it be? Right? Pick up the Bible and just read it. Uh, but um, it wasn't that easy. I found that when I picked up the Bible, it wasn't that easy. Um, in fact, it didn't make much sense to me at all when I first started looking at this book. Um, what would happen is I would take a a piece or two, right? I'd open it up, and I'd look at a verse, right? And it wouldn't make any sense. And I'd open up another one, and I'd look at a verse, another couple of pieces. It was like a puzzle that made no sense to me whatsoever. And, and, and that's how it felt, like a whole pile of puzzle pieces that just didn't intersect with each other at all. Now, I was basically a smart person, I thought. I was a relatively intelligent human. But when I read the Bible, it made me feel intimidated. It made me feel inferior, because I couldn't figure out how it all fit together. Today we're starting a new series called Long Story Short, and it's about, well, it's about the Bible, is what it's about, because we want to take the intimidation factor away uh, from the Bible. Am I the only one who was ever intimidated by the Bible? Come on, help me out here. Show a sister some love, right? I mean, really. But we want to take that away, okay? So this series is designed to do that, to help us get the picture. I'm talking about the box cover picture of what the Bible is about, right? Not just little puzzle pieces, but the box cover, the whole thing, the whole enchilada. Now, when I used to take a couple of pieces here and there and look at them, this is the sort of stuff I would get. Because it's hard to make any sense when you do piece by piece. For instance, how about this verse? This verse from 2 Corinthians 13, 12. If you take it out of context, I think we would all be way too chummy. It says this, greet one another with a holy kiss. Okay, so you came into church this morning. Look around. <laughs> all right. Who are you going to want to do a holy kiss with, right? It's scary, isn't it? Mm-hmm. This one also, Leviticus 3.16b. It's better because it justifies my love handles. All the fat belongs to the Lord. 
I'm glad he wants it because I do not want it. He can have it, every bit of it. All right, so this is funny stuff, right? But there are also times that we're taking verses a piecemeal, taking them out of context, have been really dangerous. Can be really dangerous to us and to society. Uh, for instance, um, th there were several verses that were used by slave owners to oppress people, like this one, Ephesians 6, 5a. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. That, that one, taken out of context, can do great damage. And, and some, some verses have been taken out of context, taken piecemeal, uh, to ha for men to have complete control um, over women in marriage, like this one from Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. They don't talk about the other verses that are around it saying about mutual submission and how men should uh, love their wives like Jesus loved the church. No. And then others seem just like impossible. They're just impossible to do, like Matthew 5.48a, when Jesus himself says, be ye therefore perfect. Perfect? I mean, a verse like this, it makes me think, well, I'm not perfect. I'm never going to be perfect. So I guess if that's what Jesus needs me to be, well, I'm out of this Christian thing, right? Peace out. I'm out of here. See, there are many other verses that only make sense when we see the big box top picture of what the Bible says. Is about So today, and for the next five weeks, that's what we want to do. We want to take the big picture of the Bible. And it's our prayer that God is going to use this series across all the campuses of Grace Church to do two things in our lives. Here's the first. The first thing we pray is that this is going to help us understand the whole point of the Bible so we can get it right from the beginning. And to do this, all of the campuses of Grace Church are using this book called Long Story Short. Um, you can get it um, at egracechurch.com. You can order it if you want to. You don't have to, but, but you can if you want to follow along with sort of what we're doing here. It, it, and in this book, the author, uh, Joshua McNall, he breaks down the entire story of the Bible into six parts, and that's why we have six parts to this series. Uh, and so we're going to take one part every single week. Think of it like binge watching your favorite Netflix series or something, right? Six seasons of it in a row. That's what we're going to do. And the six parts we're going to be looking at that make up the whole of the Bible are these. We're going to do creation today. Creation, the fall, and Israel. Now those three, those three parts are going to be uh, about the first like two-thirds of the Bible. That's the Old Testament, right? And then we're going to go on to Jesus, the church, and new creation. Last third of the Bible, the New Testament of the Bible. Now, if you're new to the Bible, don't worry if this doesn't make any sense to you right now. As we go along this journey, I promise you that all the individual pieces will turn into the box top, and you'll understand better. And knowing this stuff will help you want to read the Bible with more confidence in what it's saying. Now, speaking of that, that so that's the first thing. We hope to give you an overview of the Bible. Second thing we're praying that God is going to do across all the campuses of Grace Church in these next six weeks is to stir you to want to know God better by reading the Bible. We want you to do it because you know why? It's not just, you know, out of the blue. The facts are, statistically speaking, statistically speaking, the number one way that people grow spiritually is by engaging in the Bible. That's the number way, one way of doing it. And you guys woke up early on a Sunday morning to come to church. Why? I know, because you want to grow spiritually. You want to get closer to God. Right? So we hope in these next five weeks, including this one, six, that you will understand the Bible a little better and begin to want to engage in it so that you can grow spiritually. 
And so that's why, right up front here, um, in, in part one of this message series about understanding the Bible, we want to give you a tool to help you want to read it. You heard your Pastor Patty just a second ago talk about it on the video. Outside in your lobby area today uh, are some folks with some info on how to get plugged into the dive deep Bible engagement plan that we're using here at Grace Church. It's a great, it's a great tool to learn to read the Bible. And I think some small groups, um, I think y'all are fo forming some small groups around this initiative and you're gonna be able to find all that out in the lobby when you leave today. So all that to say, where do we begin? Where do I begin? Okay, I'm aging myself. Where do we begin to dive this morning into the big task of understanding the Bible? And I suggest that we start at the beginning. We start at the beginning, right? In the, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, here we go. First book of the Bible, Genesis, the first words of the first book, it says, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. See, Genesis, the first book of the Bible, where God creates, is what we call a top button, a top button book of the Bible. What do I mean by that? Well, you ever notice when you're buttoning your shirt, if you get the top button right, all the rest of them up, right? If you get the top button wrong, all the rest of them, no, not so good, right? So Genesis is a top button book. We get creation, God's creation, right, the rest of the Bible falls into place. When we get the top button wrong, God's creation, the rest of the buttons do not fall into place. And we can't see how the Bible relates to us, and we don't understand it correctly. So, what we want to find out today is what does the Bible say about how God created the universe? Because we want to get it right. And here's the truth. Every religion, every religion there is, um, every cult, there is, every culture has a way that they believe things got started, right? Every, every, everybody does. Everybody has a legend around this. But the Bible story is unique because what the Bible says about how God created actually helps us understand the nature of God and how he feels about everything he created and how he feels about us. So this is really important. Get out your pen. The first thing we see about creation and how God, what, what, what the Bible says about how God created is this. Number one, God created the universe complete and purposeful. He created the universe complete and purposeful. Now, in the book of Genesis, where it all starts, Genesis gives us two perspectives on creation. Each is important. You'll see why. Because the first perspective is majestic. It's majestic. First, the Bible talks about how God created everything. One day he did this. The second day he did this. The third day he did this. It's the majestic view of creation. But that's not all. Because the second perspective is different. It's more intimate. After we talk about the majestic of everything that create, got created every single day and how that happened, God talks about people. He talks about creating humans. He talks about Adam and Eve. See, in both the majestic and the intimate, the point is that we're not here accidentally. God did not do things willy-nilly. He had a purpose, and, and the creation story tells us that the purpose was not a result of a war of the gods, like some of the cultures and some of the other religions say. It's not, it's not due to some random explosion of gases or atoms, like some creation stories might say. No, in the Genesis accounts, God creates the universe and people with purposeful intention. And over and over again, God says the same thing 
after he creates everything. Genesis 1.10 is one example. In fact, it's on the screen. Read it with me. Go. And God saw that it was good. He said he saw it was what? Good. It was good. The creation, the world, the people, good. Created good. Again and again, God creates and stands back and says, this is good. Oh, yeah, I'm creating this, and this is good, too. Oh, let's do this, and that's good. So what does God mean when he says that everything is good? Well, is it the opposite of bad? Is it the opposite of evil? No. Think about it. You know, bad and evil hasn't been created yet. So, so good, when God says everything is good, what he means is he means it's, it's complete lacks nothing. Uh, God is pleased with his results. He's made it perfectly intended the way he intended to make it. It's good just like it is. It's perfect. And guess what? When he makes people, he says that's good too. He says people are good. See, we, you and I, we are not made for, from leftovers. We're not made from scraps. No, Look at me at Genesis 126, where we make our entrance on the grand stage of the creation story. It says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They'll reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. You know, if you're a circler, if you've if you got a pen and you're a circler, um, Circle something in your notes, if you're a circling kind of person. It's the phrase, in our image. In our image. We are made in the image of God. Do you know why God's creation is good? Because we're made in the image of God. God's creation is good because God is good. God's creation is perfect because God is perfect. God's creation is complete because God is complete. And we're made in God's image. So we, we are just as God intended us to be. See, these words tell us that all people, all creation, are created in the image of God. Because God is big enough to rule this mighty universe majestically, but he's small enough to live within our hearts. See, one way to think of this is that we have a God gene in our spiritual DNA. Do you know you have a God gene in your spiritual DNA? So all people are created in the image of God. Here's where the challenge comes in. Here's where the problem comes in. The problem comes in is some people don't know it. Some people don't realize it yet. Uh, it's not like the people who don't know Jesus aren't created in the image of God. We are. We're all created in the image of God. But some of us just don't know it yet. And so we can't live that out because we don't know it. I don't know if you know that you are created in the image of God yet, but just in case you don't, I want us to say together, I am created in the image of God. Go. I am created in the image of God. Let's try it again. I am created in the image of God. Hey, look at the person next to you and say, you are created in the image of God. Let's do it. You are created in the image of God. You are, and so am I. You have a God-stamped image on you and in you. Now, like I said, some people haven't submitted their life to Jesus yet, and so they don't get to live that out. They don't, they don't get the glory of that. Uh, and you know what? That was me 25 years ago, be before I gave my life to Christ. I didn't know it. And so I was living like I didn't know it. Now, other times, you know, after we've submitted our lives to Christ, um, we know we're made in the image of God. But you know what happens? Life piles up, right? Life piles up on us, and we forget. We tend to forget that we're made in the image of God, right? And, and that's me sometimes today, when things get a little hairy. But we ought to remember. We ought to remember because God created us perfect, lacking nothing. And, and when we say things like, oh, I'm just a sinner, I'm 
That is bad theology, friends. When we say, I'm just, I'm just human, I can't help it because I'm just a sinner, bad theology. Because when we say that, actually, we're, that's subhuman. Because we're created in the image of God. If you, if you get that, say yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, for now, I want you to know that you are created in the image of God, and we are good. God says so. And the earth he created is good. And the creation story continues with our link to the earth he created. Genesis 2.15 tells us what that is. It says, the Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. To tend and watch over it. So what are we here for? Okay, so we're but we're also purposeful. What are we here for? We are here to care for everything. To care for everything he made. The earth, his people. Each of us is given our own way and our own ability, our own reason for doing this, for living. To weave in with everybody else's reason and way that God has created us to do it. Into a huge puzzle that fits together to care for the creation in the way that he has made us. Now, I know your Pastor Patty talks about this all the time, how you are wonderfully and purposefully made to do your part, to go out into the world and be the church, into the big story of God's plan of love. So today I want to bless you with this. You are not an accident. You are on purpose. You are here for purpose. And a good God made you to reflect his image. You are God-dreamed. You're God-designed. You are God-desired. You are created on purpose for a purpose. We need you. We need each other. You're unique in what you are and who you are. You're called to make a difference in this world that only you can make. Know this. Own this. Live this. The Bible confirms this. It's a top-button thing, friends. So that's number one. Now look at me at the second fill-in-the-blank. What does the Bible say about how God created the universe? Well, number two, God created the universe from and for community. From community and for community. I want to take a closer look at the scripture we already read, Genesis 1.26. We're going to read it in a little bit different way. In fact, this time, read it with me. It's on the screen. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Now, the part I want to look at now, instead of in our image, I want to look at uh, two words. At circle them in your notes, if you're a circling kind of person. And these are the words, our, as in our image, and us, to be like us. I, I just have something to say about these two words. Well, why are these words plural? Why are these two words plural? How come it's not... Um, um, let me make human beings in my image to be like me. Why is it plural? Well, the point is this, that, that, that God is in community with himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three in one, one in three. God is in community with himself. I don't know how it works. I don't know how it works. I have no idea. It's a mystery. And it's a mystery that points to God's living in constant community with himself. And nobody knows exactly how it works either. And, but, but personally, I mean, for me, I would, rather, I would rather believe in a God that I can't completely understand than shrink God to fit into my finite thought patterns. How about you? Yes. So let's abandon our need to make God in our image for a minute, right? 
and let's allow him to make us in their image. Let's just catch a glimpse that God exists in community with himself. And here's what else. When we're created, therefore, we're not created just from community of God, but we're created in their image. Therefore, we're created for community just like God is. See, God didn't just make one person. God made humans. There's a lot of us, right? When God creates, he creates in community with himself, and then he makes us, humans, for community with one another. That's what the image of God means, that we're also community as God is community. In fact, if you look at the first crisis in the Bible, we think about the first crisis of the Bible as being when the snake attempts uh, tempts Adam and Eve uh, with sin, with doing something that God told them not to do, right? And so we think of it as like a moral failing, like a moral um, issue, a moral crisis, but it's not. Uh, The first crisis in the Bible is one of community. And here's the first crisis, Genesis 2.18. Listen closely. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who's just right for him. What up with this? This is good, this is good, this is good. Everything I've created is good, 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 says God. And now God says, what? It is not It is not good. And what did God say wasn't good? For people to be alone. Aloneness. God said, I did not make my best creation, my finest work, to go through life alone. I made humanity to be social. See, the Hebrew word, the Hebrew word that's translated helper here is sometimes misunderstood. Sometimes, see, this is another thing that you can take out of context and just, like, do all kinds of things and run with it. No. The Hebrew word helper um, doesn't mean subordinate. It means a perfect counterpart. It means like, across, um, in cooperation with one another. Somebody who comes alongside somebody else. The big idea is that God made us for each other. We were made to be social. And here's the thing, friends. There are so many dangers these days in trying to go it alone. We are an individualistic society. Our culture, our world is very alone. You know, Cigna, Cigna has a sad survey that points to an epidemic of loneliness. According to the Centers for Disease Control, the suicide rate among youth is off the chain. A, a, a brand new a Vanderbilt University study finds depression is rising uh, in alarming degrees among the Gen Xers, uh, uh, people in their late 30s and in, in their 40s. Early this month, HBO began a series um, highlighting that life expectancy among all Americans, listen to this, life expectancy has declined driven by what researchers call deaths of despair, caused by things like drug overdoses, increased alcohol abuse, suicide. The life expectancy is going down. God's answer to this is the family of God. Is the family of God. If, friends, if, if, if you're struggling today, if you're struggling today with aloneness, the family of God is here. Just talk to somebody with a name tag, somebody in the lobby, somebody... We, we, we'll get you connected. Do you know that 58 times in the New Testament, 58 times the word one another, the words one another is used? Love one another, care for one another, pray for one another, exhort one another, encourage one another, greet one another, and on and on and on. God wants you to care for others and be cared for by others. I'm going to end with this story. Last Friday, Good Friday, um, at the Cape Coral campus, we had baptisms, just like you were going to do, except it was raining here. Um, And we had them at the Choose Recovery uh, uh, service that always happens on Friday night that that I get the opportunity uh, to lead. And one of the people we baptized at this baptized service, uh, baptism service at at Choose Recovery uh, on Good Friday, 
uh, we had a baptism service, and one of the people we baptized was a nine-year-old boy named Aiden. Let me tell you his story. Aiden said that his life before he knew Jesus was filled with confusion from changing from place to place. He was in and out of foster care uh, since he was two years old. He says he lied a lot. He was not a good listener. And he came to know Jesus when he started attending the Grace Church Cape Coral Campus children's ministry called Grace Place. And he said, and I quote, the kids were fun. Mr. CJ smiled all the time. I liked the worship music. It made me happy. And then he said this, my life today is much different now that I know Jesus. I was adopted May 9th of last year, and now I have a permanent home, and I don't have to move from place to place. I've learned that Jesus heals and that he's good, and he helps me with my anger. I don't lie anymore. At least I try not to. Jesus helps calm me down when I'm playing baseball. I'm still afraid sometimes at night. When I think about Jesus and pray, it helps me to not be afraid. And that's why I want to be baptized today. Amen. Aiden's life was in pieces. His life was in pieces. <laughs> he went from place to place. He didn't have a home. But thanks to Tanya and Buddy Roberts, he has a home now because he was adopted. And not only that home, he was adopted into the family of God. And he has a church family to call his own. When our life is in pieces, friends, when it's a puzzle we can't solve, we can turn to Jesus because he wants to welcome us home. We're not alone because he has made us for one another. He's made us in his very image, friends. And he stood back and he said, it's good. This is good. And that is the long story short of this book, the Bible. That's it. That's the, that's the beginning of it, the top button. God created you complete and on purpose. God created you from and for community and for a purpose. It wasn't by accident. When we know this deep in our souls, when we start that on page one, we can live like this the rest of the pages. That's the foundation. That's the foundation we begin this story of the Bible on. And we'll continue it next week. Let's stand for prayer. God, thank you for your message. Thank you for starting us on the right foot. Thank, thank you that we're not, we're not starting on a, on a foot where we think that we have to prove something to you or, or that you've created us to be your servants or, or that um, you're, look, you're looking at us and and expecting something of us that we don't know what it is. Thanks for starting us in your Bible with a good top button so that the rest of it lines up, that you love us, you created us in your image, you created us for each other, and that we're not an accident, and that you love us, God. And we thank you for this, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.